this time to become the first to win Canada's Triple Tiara, the Triple Crown for Phillies, aboard the always unpredictable Sealy Hill. Sealy Hill was an interesting filly. She, uh, you never knew which direction she was going to run. Patrick, in fact, he, it's funny, Patrick had won the, uh, the Triple Tiara, and he said to me, middle of last year, he said, I still don't know how to ride this filly. After the run for the tiara, Patrick convinced owner Eugene Melnick and Mark Cassie to bring Sealy Hill to California to run in the 2008 Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Turf. Beg Eugene and beg Mark Cassie, please just give this horse one shot. And Mark said to, Mark said to me, Patrick, you sure you know what you're doing? I said, yes. I break her and I had to last the whole way and I wasn't worried. So when I swing from home, I wait, I wait, and then a big gap open up by the eighth hole, and she come from like last to first, like that. Right on the outside, forever together, and now the long shot, Sealy Hill, forever together, forget it. You're the Breeders' Cup, and you last, and then next minute, you bust through the crowd, you just get beat in the nose at 25 to 1. I mean, what more can you ask? Now, after all the success Patrick and Mark have had together in Canada, they have begun to focus on the two things that every jockey and trainer dream of, wins in the Breeders' Cup and Kentucky Derby, something that they don't see either one doing without the other. 13 years of being in Canada, I've been actually nearly every major race, you know what I mean, and so it's, no, it's time enough now for me to win the Breeders' Cup or oh, Derby. That's, that's what I'm focusing on right now. You know, Patrick's kind of like a son to me now, and um, I enjoy winning, but I don't know if, if, if there's as much fulfillment if he's not aboard. Um, we have a bond, and, and it works, and um, so it was nice to have our first derby, derby runner together. Now we just have to have our first derby winner. Don't go away. The Sport of Kings will be right back. Our next piece looks at two horse racing legends, one a horse and one a jockey. First, it would be Kelso, five-time horse of the year, and I did say five times, and his rider, Hall of Famer, Ismael Milo Valenzuela, who recently passed away from a long illness. This is the story of Kelso. No horse dominated American thoroughbred racing over such an extended period as did Kelso. Mrs. Richard C. DuPont's marvelous gelding was voted Horse of the Year for five consecutive seasons from 1960 through 1964. By your host from the Count Fleet mare, Maid of Flight, Kelso possessed a hard deer-like quality, slim, racy, efficient. His one vulnerability appeared early in his racing career and kept him out of the Triple Crown events. That flaw, a faulty stifle, disappeared early enough to allow him to win the Jockey Club Gold Cup at three. At four, Kelso joined Whisk Broom and Tom Fool as only the third horse in history to win the venerable New York Triple, the Metropolitan, Suburban, under 135 pounds, and the Brooklyn Handicap, under 136. Here, Kelso rolled to his third Woodward in succession. Crimson Satan coming on third. Carried back, back to fourth, and Garwall is fifth. Coming through the stretch, that's Kelso in the middle of the track. We've never been for the lead. Crimson Satan third. Carried back fourth, and Garwall is fifth. Running yards to go, it's Kelso going away by four lengths. Never been second. By 1964, Kelso was pitted against yet another generation for King of New York, and the Woodward that year provided one of the great turf dramas of his career. His principal foes were Gunbow and Quadrangle. Gunbow, a natural speed horse, was sent straight away from the gate into the lead by his jockey, Walter Blum. It would be up to Milo Valenzuela on Kelso to force the pace early and keep up the pressure, else the race would be a runaway for the speed horse. Dropping back to last. Coming into the stretch now, that's Gunbow and Kelso whipping and driving on the outside with Quadrangle along the ramp. Coming through the stretch, it's Kelso getting his head in front. Gunbow alongside second. On the rail, it's Quadrangle third. Kelso on the outside, but Gunbow hasn't given up yet. 20 yards to go now. It's Kelso and Gunbow head and head and nose and nose. As they go over the finish line, it's a photograph to 
The question was, who won? The writers didn't know, neither did the trainers. Minutes passed while the placing judges inspected the magnified image of two nodding heads separated by an infinitesimal margin. Gunbo had defeated the game old veteran this time, but Kelso merely picked himself up and came charging on. First, he won the Jockey Club Gold Cup for the fifth consecutive time while Gunbo sat on the sidelines. Then, in Maryland, he faced his young rival in the Laurel International. Kelso had run second at Laurel on three previous occasions, leading some to doubt his grass ability and world-class competition. In the fading light of November 11, 1964, Kelso met his newest rival for the final time, with Horse of the Year honors on the line. Gunbo again had an easy early lead, and Kelso must depend on his own courage to overtake his youthful opponent. For a moment, it seemed a rerun of their torrid Woodward duel, but appropriately, the gold of the Maryland afternoon was matched by a flawless performance as Kelso set a new American record for the mile and a half distance, running the final quarter of a mile faster than the first quarter had been clocked. He was trained all his career by Carl Hanford, and when Kelso was retired, he led the money won list with more than $1,900,000. But more importantly, he had won the love and affection of millions of people. Don't go away. The Sport of Kings will be right back. I first met Eddie Logan several years ago when I was riding that Santa Anita racetrack in Southern California. Logan was perhaps one of the coolest guys one could ever meet. Now if you're wondering what Logan does, for over 70 years, Eddie Logan has been shining shoes at Santa Anita racetrack. Now in 97, guess what he's doing? Same thing, with a smile. Eddie is a link to our great and glorious past. He's just the greatest performer as Seabiscuit or John Henry or Shoemaker. Getting 97 years old, I, I, I am what I used to be. How many 97-year-old men do you know that are still showing up at work and still doing their job? Call me the foot man out there now. So I take care of I take care of leather. I take care of the racetrack, guys working on the racetrack. He does actually a pretty good job on your shoes too, and he'll let you know it because he's the foot man. And uh, he's a real kick and he makes everybody smile. And you know, he just he's a comfort level here. He is a, a constant, he knows what's going on, he knows all the people. He's an absolute delight. He's always the same, never changes his character, is always the same, day after day. You know, he's been here forever and, and he's, he's such a character, such a good person. It's hard not to be attracted to go sit there and get your shoes shine and have a visit with one of your best friends. He has been at Santa Anita as an employee since Santa Anita opened its doors in 1934. Doc's through. He bought the track in 32. But they had it ready to go in 34. So when I got the track built, then they got me over there from Arcadia. I was working at, and I was in Santa Anita. You know, Eddie's experienced it all. He's seen racetracks uh, change, and he's, he's been here since day one. He's just, uh, he's part of us. It's Seabiscuit on the rail, Seabiscuit and Kayak. Seabiscuit and Kayak, they're coming down there, and Seabiscuit, Seabiscuit wins it, a new world champion comes down there, he wins it, and listen to the crowd, all by themselves. They got him in the race and the horses they thought could beat him didn't have no chance to beat him. Uh -uh. It's just, it just fun to see how he do it. It, 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 do, it do it so easy. Eddie can go on and on. He can tell you stories for all day long. That's my problem. That was he loved playing baseball. He was with the Kansas City Monarchs and he played shortstop and he was called Stubby. 
which I think was just, they said he was just round like a little bowling ball, and he just thoroughly enjoyed it. Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig. Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig. Yeah, well, well, that's good. I played an exhibition game with him. That's how I started out, playing an exhibition game. That's how I learned how to hit. He also loved boxing, and that's what brought him to Los Angeles. He came here because there were more prize fights and he could make a lot more money. And here he is. It doesn't matter if they're shining shoes or the governor. If they're good people and they're trying hard to do their job right, and they care. One's just as valuable as the next, and there's nobody more valuable than Eddie Logan. When you walk down that walkway and you hear his voice, it just it's me and Santa Anita, you're here at the races. <laughs> it gives you a real comfort feeling knowing, you know, there's Eddie. He's been here for years, naturally, and, and he's just a, a real fixture. How many tracks have an individual that has been with them for almost 70 years, who puts his heart and soul into it every single day. It is with great pride and admiration that Santa Anita honors Eddie Logan today and for all time with the Eddie Logan Stakes. Presenting the trophy for this, the inaugural running of the Eddie Logan Stakes, is the one and only Eddie Logan himself. Eddie, I'm told that give you the leather, you get it together, and you, all you keep saying is you're the footman. I am the footman. Get the leather, come see me. I'm together with leather. <laughs> it's a good thing that we have a stakes race named after him. He deserves it. He could just sit in a chair and watch TV and smoke his pipe. But that's not what he wants to do. He wants to be useful, contributing to society, and enjoying what he's getting back from society. It's hard to think of Santa Anita without Eddie because they go hand in hand. So it would be a great loss. I mean, just just his his banter, his just him being there. It would be a huge loss for Santa Anita. Santa Anita will survive without any of us, but it'll survive a lot better as long as Eddie Logan's here. I just love it. I love the game. I love it. Okay, that's it for this edition of the Sport of Kings. And on behalf of everyone here, we want to say thank you for allowing us to spend this last half hour with you on this Saturday morning. Two things to leave you with. We want to thank our friends south of the border at HRTV for supplying most of the footage that you saw today along with check out their website, HRTV. It's a new website, hrtv.com. And most of all, don't forget next week, two big stakes, the BC Derby, the BC Oaks, that's next week. Remember, keep them straight or we will get you on that final turn. Enjoy the weekend. <laughs>